Okay, I want to welcome everybody at our 2D8 campus, our Friendswood campus, our Alvin campus, our Webster campus, our Pearland campus, our online campus, and everybody up north at the Weibo Bible Church of Weibo, Montana. It's almost Christmas, people. It's almost Christmas. Isn't that a great? I, I can't believe it's uh, here so quickly. Uh, question as we begin, who still has Christmas shopping left to go? Anybody want to admit that? Okay, we will pray for you today. We'll pray for you today. Pray for me as well. But... Um, Next Sunday is Christmas Eve, and, uh, and I know that you've already been reminded about the Christmas Eve services, so I want to go one week after that. The weekend after Christmas Eve is New Year's weekend, New Year's Eve weekend, and it's going to be uh, 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 New Year's Eve is actually on a Sunday this year. And so uh, the Thursday before this Sunday, so the Thursday between Christmas and New Year's, we're not going to have a Thursday service. Not going to have a Thursday service. Sunday morning we will gather 8.15, 9.45, and 11.15, but no uh, Thursday service between Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. Hope that you uh, remember that. In fact, I'm going to send out an email reminding everybody of the different service times for Christmas Eve and also New Year's Eve. And if you're, if you're uh, not on our email list, like you don't get into the updates, uh, go to our website, uh, create an account, then you'll get all of the updates as they become available. And just so you know, and the people who are already on that list know that we don't send out too many emails. Is that true? We don't send out too many. I have a friend, he's a pastor. Too many emails, too many emails. I'm on his email list. I'm not going to say his name out loud because he might watch this. So if he's watching right now, it's not you. It's not you. Uh, um, but uh, like every other day, man, I'm like, really? Do you have that much to say? But um, so if you sign up, we, we promise not to inundate you with emails, but just enough to keep you updated on what's going on. All right. So uh, uh, just re that's a reminder, uh, Christmas Eve, then New Year's Eve, no service uh, on the weekend, uh, no Thursday service on the weekend of, of New Year's Eve. Right. So let's do this. Let's get into part four of Down to Earth Christmas. And in this series, we're keeping things sort of down to earth. And what we're really doing is we're learning from the example of Jesus and how, how he came down to earth. We're learning from him, but not that we're, we're, we're not Jesus. Amen to that. We're not Jesus. But we are supposed to look at and to learn from his example. And so I hope that you've been uh, uh, growing throughout this uh, series. Yeah, somebody's excited. Um, <laughs> So week one, we learned about uh, him coming down as the word. Remember, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Week two, uh, we learned about him bringing his presence to human beings. And uh, Pastor Jeremy thought that with uh, him uh, gathering at the table, oftentimes with other people and even with sinners. And then last week, we talked about him coming down in humility, humility. And, and uh, that was uh, from Philippians chapter two. And, uh, and this week we're gonna talk about him coming down as light. And yes, there is something that we can learn for this, from this for our own lives. Now, one of the things that's true about our Christmas celebrations around the world this time of year is that lights are always a part of that celebration. Lights are always a part of the celebration. How many of you uh, right now have lights on your house? Right now, raise your hand. All of our campuses, be proud of it. Okay, good, good, good. Good for you. Good for you. Um, uh, how many of you are, are more like me and you, 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 you would rather drive around and look at other people's lights than to say, okay, all right, very good. And I really think that's the spiritual way to do it. I do it because... <laughs> It's a lot of humility. It's like, I don't want people looking at my house. I'd rather go look and give the glory to other people who've done the work. And so, I'm just kidding. If you have lights on your house, that's awesome. Because I was driving around looking with my family last night. And it is fun to drive around and look. And when you do drive around and look, you see houses that are... Um, uh, that have lots of lights. Lots of lights. And uh, I'm not going to say anything negative about the pictures I'm about to show you. Nothing negative, but I'm just going to say this. That's a lot of lights, right? <laughs> That's a lot. Amen. That's a lot of lights. Uh, here's another one. Then this one, this one uh, has, and I read the, the report because I was reading about different houses. This one has 50 inflatables. 50. 50. This house also comes with a hum uh, all night long. The little fan motors keeping these things inflated. And uh, then that, uh, that's nothing compared to this guy. Now, you can't tell by looking at this picture, but uh, it's over, over the top. This is um, in Arizona. Guy's been decorating for 30 years. 
He has over 265,000 lights on his house and lawn, 265,000. He has a 100-foot tree that he uh, decorates. He has flying reindeer. He has six animatronic uh, window displays that are, you know, waving at people and so forth. And, 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 and I'm just going to conclude uh, this part of the sermon by saying, that's a lot. That's a lot of lights. And, and, uh, and then there's guys like this next guy that I'm going to show you. His neighbor, his neighbor really decorated, and he put this in his yard. <laughs> that's a man after my own heart right there. But uh, it is fun to drive around and look, isn't it? And uh, even if we say, man, I would never put that many lights in my yard, we're still looking, we're still looking, right? And we're driving by and we're enjoying it. Yes, some might be considered over the top, some are simple, some have everything but Jesus, and some have only Jesus, but there's something about lights this time of year. Did you know that we're in the darkest time of year this week? The absolute, when the night is the longest, is happening uh, this next week, and uh, perfect time to celebrate Christmas and the light of Jesus coming into this world. And when you think about it, if, if, uh, if we live back in the day uh, when Jesus was born and that, on that first Christmas, if, if we were out trying to look at some lights, like we were like, let's go look at Christmas lights, you know, and, and uh, get on the donkey, let's go. <laughs> uh, there was no electricity, so there would be no lights, not even like this guy's house, no, no lights like that. And um, Maybe not any displays of any kind to mention anywhere, but, but there were lights mentioned that first Christmas in, in the Christmas story. And let me, let me share these with you. One, one would have been, uh, as we read in Matthew's account of the, of the Christmas story, we see the wise men following a light, which was what? A star, a star up in the sky. Uh, and they followed that light from a great distance. And uh, there's been some speculation, some guessing about where they came from. Some people say Babylonia, which was uh, uh, known for studying the stars. Some say uh, that they came from Persia. Uh, and and, and, and the, the theory goes with the, with the Persia folks is that uh, they believe he came from Persia because there's an old painting in the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem that when the Persians invaded that area in 614 AD, they destroyed every church in their path until they got to the Church of the Nativity. But uh, uh, the story goes like this, that once they saw that painting of the wise men dressed as Persians, dressed as Persians, that they did not destroy uh, that church. And so many people believe that uh, uh, they came from Persia. Uh, some say that they came from Arabia, and that's based on an old Arabic writing that talked about men going to visit a baby king. Uh, it's also because uh, Arabia would be the uh, origin of one of the gifts that the wise men gave to Jesus, which is this gift right here. Anybody know what this is? Just a little quiz, a little quiz here. Anybody know what that is? Okay, you're all wrong. It's, uh, it's frankincense, frankincense, which was a costly spice back in the day, fit for a king, as they say. And, and uh, it comes from a type of tree that grew in the southern coastal area of Arabia. So people say, you know, based on that, based on an ancient Arabic writing about uh, men going to visit a baby king, that uh, maybe they came from Arabia. But guess what? Guess what? We don't know. We don't know. Here's what we do know from, from the text in the book of Matthew, that they followed the star. They followed the star. So we know that the star was there according to what the Bible says. And, and why did they follow a star? I mean, why did you just get up one day and say, let's go follow that star? <laughs> why follow the star? Well, uh, maybe they had in their possession a copy of the Old Testament and specifically Numbers chapter 24, where it gives this prophecy about the Messiah. A star will come, come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Scepter meaning king. And so maybe when they saw the star rising out of Jacob or out of Israel, uh, they knew that a new king had been born. And so they went to Israel. They, and the first stop they made was in Jerusalem. 
And they went to King Herod because, you know, he's a king, so he should know where the new king is. And they asked him, can you tell us where the new king we've, is? We, we know that he's been born. We've come to meet him. And that uh, threw Herod into a loop that we're not going to talk about today. But um, they left the palace and they went to Bethlehem and they found Jesus there in Bethlehem. And Matthew tells us that they fell down and worshiped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So that first Christmas, the star is a light that we see in the Christmas story. So back on the donkey, let's ride some more. Um, And another light that we might see riding around on that uh, first Christmas would be uh, uh, the angels appearing to the shepherds. And and, uh, this is out of Luke chapter 2. And, you know, back in the day, pre-electricity in the small town of Bethlehem, I'm going to go out on a very short limb and say it was dark out in the fields. It was dark at night, and uh, I don't know if you know what dark is. Like, if you've only lived in the Houston area and you've never ventured out at nighttime way out in the country, then you don't know what dark is. Am I right about that? Anybody have been out way out in the country and you've seen a dark, dark night? I mean, it is crazy. Here in the Houston area, there's always like the lights of the car dealership or something that are lighting up the night sky, so it's a little bit more difficult to see, you know, the stars and but uh, uh, you get out into the countryside. In fact, has anyone ever been uh, to West Texas, uh, Big Bend area, the observatory, all that? Anybody been out in that area? Okay, yeah, a few. Um, they, they say that that is the darkest, one of the darkest places in the United States and also that it is one of the clearest places in the United States, which is why the observatory is there. But my son, I haven't been there, but my son Jordan's been there and he said that when you're driving at night, you can only see what your headlights are pointed on. He said, everything else around them, everything out the side windows, you can't see. He said, it's like when you look out your window, like you're driving down the road, you look out your window, it's like somebody's put a thick black blanket on your car and wrapped you up. And he said, it's like hand in the face, can't see kind of dark. Well, imagine that kind of darkness outside of Bethlehem, not even in Bethlehem, in the the fields outside of Bethlehem. You're uh, uh, watching the sheep, or ac- actually you're probably kicked back and uh, listening to make sure that they're okay, and maybe you got your head on a rock, and you're uh, staring up and the, to the pitch black, maybe noticing a few stars up above you, or maybe a lot of stars, who knows. But then all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden, verse uh, uh, 9 through 12 in Luke chapter 2, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with what? Great fear. How many of you understand that, right? I mean, if you were in that situation, it'd be like, wow, okay, wow, what is happening here? Last week, if you were with us, we talked about the transfiguration of Jesus and how he's up on the mountain with uh, Peter, James, and John, and that the disciples said that his glory shone through like the glory of God uh, beamed from his face, and it was like the sun was shining in their eyes, and that's the glory of God. Now imagine you were in that darkness in the, in the field, and the glory of God like hits you, and uh, of course you would be afraid, but the angel started the discourse this way, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, meaning Bethlehem, a Savior who is the Messiah. He's Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger in the once the, once the angels had disappeared back into heaven, immediately the shepherds got up and they went to see Jesus. So those are a couple of lights that we see in that first Christmas story as we drive around on the donkey, but there is actually another light. And it is the most important light of them all. It is the, it is the light about whom the Christmas story is all uh, focused on and um, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. I want to I want to go to John chapter 1. Now we read John chapter 1 in week 1 when we talked about the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us and and then I quoted from it last week but this week we're going to use it once again but uh, three verses in particular that uh, talk about the light and uh, emphasis on the word light this time around. Okay, John chapter 1 beginning verse 4. Talking about Jesus says in him was life and the life was the what? Light of men, okay? The light shines in the darkness, and thank you, God, the darkness has not overcome it. 
I can preach a whole sermon on that right there. Uh, Verse 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Again, these verses are talking about Jesus, uh, calling him the light, equating him with light. Jesus, infinite creator God, who we've talked about before, has no beginning, no end, who is outside of time, uh, who who called himself light, who called himself I am the light of the world, meaning the I am part of it is uh, he's equating himself with God, and people got that and understood that back in the day. And so he is light. He's referred to as light. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16 says he, he dwells in inapproachable light. So you think about that as light, 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 whenever talking about the Lord and talking about Jesus. And now I have a simple question. What does the light of Jesus do in our lives? What is the light? He came as light, so what does that light do in our lives? And so from several texts um, in, in the Bible, I, I just want to do this. Several texts about Jesus being light. I just want to talk about what his light does in our lives. First of all, if you're taking notes, Jesus shines light on things that we want to hide. He illuminates the things that maybe we don't want other people to see. Like if you want to hide something from somebody, uh, the way that we say that is you're trying to keep those people in the dark. You know, you're keeping them in the dark because the light illuminates. If you have guests coming over to your house and your house is not clean, what do you do? You turn down the lights, right? And, uh, and then you light a few candles, right? You light some candles and people come over, they're like, oh. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah, thank you so much. Or if you want to sell your car, when do you sell it? Sunset. Sunset. It's true. Cars look better when the sun is going down because the light illuminates things that we want to hide. And for this particular point, I want to look at a story in uh, John chapter 8. And, and this story kind of ramps up to Jesus' proclamation about himself. And that's what I really want to get to but we're not going to leave out the story that goes before it. So what happened was this. In John chapter 8, some of the religious leaders who hated Jesus brought a woman who was caught in the act of adultery to Jesus, tossed her down at Jesus' feet, and said to Jesus, the law says that we should stone her. Like, see, we, we, should, we should kill her right here with stones. What do you say? And uh, they, they asked this question because they were trying to trap Jesus, but Jesus gave a non-answer at first. He, uh, when, when asked this question, uh, you know, the law says that we should stone her, what do you think we should do? Jesus, the Bible says, just got down, he stooped down onto the ground, and he started writing stuff in the dirt with his finger. So it's like he's not listening, but he's just writing on the ground. So they keep peppering him with this question. And so finally, he stands back up, and, uh, and, and, and then he says this. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. He says, okay, okay, go ahead and stone her. But let's do this. Let's start with the one who has not sinned. And whichever one of you has not sinned, let him be the first one to throw a stone. And, and then the Bible says he stooped down again and started writing in the dirt some more. Then comes verse 9. But when they heard Jesus' answer, uh, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones first. And, uh, and then Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. So you think about that. These guys wanted to expose a woman's sin. So they brought her to Jesus They wanted to trick Jesus. They had rocks in hand. They were ready to kill this woman. But then Jesus wrote some things in the dirt. And we don't know what he wrote. The Bible does not tell us what he wrote. There's been much much speculation about what he wrote, including from this guy right here. But that we don't know. Some some people think he wrote their names. Like everybody that had a rock with them, he wrote their names. Some people think that uh, maybe he like wrote their sin. Like here's their sin and and then made an arrow. That's that guy. (laughs) Okay, but we don't know. We don't know what he wrote. But what happened was, in that moment, they started to drop the rocks that they had brought to the party and to walk away. Older ones first, because they're like, I'm not going down this road. (laughs) And then the younger ones finally admitted it, you know, and dropped their rock as well. But here's why. 
because the light of Jesus shined into their hearts and exposed them for who they were. And that's what he does. That's what he can do. He, that, his light can shine into our hearts. He knows what we've done. He knows what we're thinking. He knows the things that, everything that we've ever, ever done, things that we don't want people to know, things that we don't want to talk about. And he looked right into these guys' hearts, and these guys had to turn and walk away. So what about the woman? What about the woman? Did she, was she a sinner? Did she have sin? No doubt. Verse 10, Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Now, I have a, a kind of a trick question for you, so don't answer me. And the, the trick question is this, was she condemned before she met Jesus? Was she condemned before she met Jesus? Now, I'm going to go to another passage in John for the answer to that question. We're going to go over to John chapter 3, and we're going to begin with verse 16, okay? And a lot of people who have been in church know this verse right here. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for that and for that verse. And then verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Now, this verse right here, I love it, but I understand something. Out of context, this might lead some people to believe that they're not condemned. And the reason I say that is because, let me show you the spiritual math that some people use. They're like, Jesus did not come to condemn Therefore, he doesn't condemn me. Therefore, I am not condemned. Therefore, I don't have to change anything in my life because Jesus didn't condemn me, okay? But let's keep it in context. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Now, listen, I know there are a whole lot of people nowadays that think, well, because Jesus doesn't condemn anyone, then no one is condemned. But this verse lets us know everyone was condemned at one time. You follow me on this? Everybody has been condemned at one time or another, unless and until they put their faith in Jesus Christ. That's when things change. That's when God is able to save. And to this young woman... Jesus says this, go, and from now on, sin no more. Sin no more, which means that what? That she was sinning some more before this. He's like, now no more, no, no more. Like you've met me now, you've had an encounter with me. Now your life needs to change. From now on, you need to live differently. And that, my friends, is the truth for all of us. Are we ever going to get it right? Are we ever going to be perfect? Are we ever going to have a time when we don't sin? Well, we're always, going to, we're always going to have that bent towards sin, but we're not supposed to live there. We're not supposed to live in that darkness. And today, if you're living there, something's got to change. Something's got to change. And, and, and if you've encountered Jesus, but you're still living there, I got a verse I'm gonna read you and it's not on the, the screen. This is uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses six and seven. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie. We lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all of our sin. Now, that's good news, but it's also a reality check for us. Are we living in that darkness? And today, if you're caught in the darkness, you don't have to live there. You don't have to stay there. By the blood of Jesus Christ, sacrificed for you on the cross, your life can change. Your life can get better. God can use you for his glory, but you got to take a step in his direction. And the very next verse, very next verse after this, this is verse 11, okay, you remember the story, a woman caught in the act of adultery. Verse 12, Jesus then says this, 
I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Which is an awesome, awesome, wonderful truth. Thank you, God, for sending your son as the light. Which is a great segue to the second point, if you're taking notes. Down to earth is light. Jesus shines light on things we want to see or on things that we need to see. Um, uh, Your home is a very safe place. But turn out the lights and that changes, right? Like if you can't see, then your home becomes more of a dangerous place. My big toe on my right foot is an illustration to that right now because I have a bruise on the knuckle. Do toes have knuckles? I have a bruise on the knuckle of the, do you want to see it? You want to see anybody wants to see it? But uh, uh, bruised pretty good, but uh, that's just an illustration that, man, we need the lights when we're walking around, and we need lights in our physical world, and we need lights in our spiritual world. We need a guiding light to show us the way, and that's what Jesus says that he has come to be in our lives. So we have, we have the light showing us that what needs to change and then showing us the way to salvation, but we also have Jesus showing us the steps that we're supposed to take in our life as well. And I was going to do something right now, but I'm not going to do it. But I was going to have some code word, you know, uh, some word that I was going to say that I was going to have all of our production people at all of our campuses just turn off all the lights. Like without me saying, turn off the lights. And I was just going to be talking that all the lights were going to go out. But, uh, I, and I was going to illustrate it, you know, and to talk about it. But I thought, you know, if you do that, some people may panic. And, <laughs> and then they'll start to run out and they'll trip and they'll fall and then they'll sue. And we don't need that. And so, <clears throat> so well, we're not going to do that. They got x All right. So uh, not going to do that. But I did think about it. I thought about it. And I thought, you know, if, the, if, if that happened, because I know what I feel when stuff like that happens, like, First thing is, I gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of here. But you're almost paralyzed because you don't know what step to take. Like I wanna get out of here, but I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And spiritually, we can have the same thing happen to us. Like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't. And you just kinda are frozen. Well, in uh, John chapter 12, verse 46, Jesus said these wonderful words. He says, I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer wander in darkness. Meaning he's gonna guide us. We don't have to wander in the darkness. So we get saved because of his light. We repent of our sins, we turn to him, but also he shines the light for us. Now, there are times in my life when I don't know what step to take. I don't know. And so I kind of have three simple rules that I use in my life And I thought I would share them today, and hopefully these will be helpful for somebody today. Rule number one, if I don't know what step to take, I get on my knees and ask God to show me. So instead of stepping, like I don't know what step to take, I don't know what step, don't step. Kneel, right? And pray about it and ask God for wisdom. James chapter one, verse five, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously without finding fault, and it shall be given to him. So he's promised that he's he's gonna give us wisdom We just need to ask. Also, uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. So we have the promise from Scripture that we're going to get wisdom. We're going to get direction. He's going to light our path, show us where to go. But now I'm going to be honest and tell you that sometimes, even after I do this, I still don't know what step to take. Is that too much honesty today from the pastor? Sometimes, how many of you would admit that? Sometimes even after you pray, you're like, I still don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. So here's rule number two. If I don't know what step to take, I keep doing what God told me to do until God tells me to do something different. Just keep doing what you know that God wanted you to be doing a while back, and you're doing it now, and maybe you're having some doubts. I don't know what to do. I don't. Well, do what you do know, Right? And there'll be people who'll be like, well, I just, you know, I've been, I, I've been uh, just wondering what God wants next. I think I'm just going to quit my job. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Why? Because I don't know what God wants me to do. Well, then don't quit your job. All right? Just, you know, or people are like, I'm going to think I'm going to sell everything and get a motorcycle, you know, and go find myself. No, I'll find you. You're right there. And just... <laughs> 
keep doing what you're doing or they're going to sell everything and move, you know, to the jungle and another country and, and whatever. It's like, just s- slow down. And, and if you don't have clear leading from God, do this instead. Keep doing what you knew God wanted you to do when you last had clear leading from him. Right? And, uh, and, and, and then, one more. If I don't know what step to take, I read God's word until my spirit is calm. Until I have peace. That's what I mean by that. And uh, I've had people ask me, you know, how, 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 how much of the Bible do you read each day or how long do you read each day? It varies. It could be 15 minutes. It could be an hour and a half. Who knows? And part of the calculus that I use in that is if my spirit is uneasy, like if there's decisions on the table and so forth, I read more. And I can literally read until I have peace. And it works, and I would, I would urge you to do it as well. But just read and read and read, because there's something about reading about the creator of the universe, working his plan throughout thousands of years, uh, a God who is large and in charge, a God who always has a plan, a God who has a plan for me, a God who has a plan for you, a God who loves you and loves me so much that he sent his son to die on the cross in our place. A God who loves us, who has a plan, whose plan is good, I know that after I read my Bible for a while, that he's going to take care of me, and he's going to give me guidance. It's not always when I want him to give it. Like he's, he waits a little while longer than I want him to sometimes, but I have learned to be good with that, to be okay with that. So whether the guidance comes tomorrow or 10 years from now, he's God, I'm not, I'm just following him. I'm living, I'm up, trying to live for his glory, Okay. So hopefully that helps somebody today. But he will light the way for us, all right? And then I got one more for you, main point. And then you need to go finish your Christmas shopping, all right? <laughs> Last one is this. Jesus shines light on our lives so others can see him. He shines light on our lives so others can see him. So he has that convicting light, but also the light that we follow and, and come to him Um, He has a light that lights our path, but he also has light that he shines on us so that others can see Jesus and see his glory. I once heard a pastor say, there's no such thing as darkness. There's only the absence of light. Technically, that is true. And if it is true in the world, it's probably true spiritually in this, that what this dark world needs right now, and there's a lot of junk going on in the world right now, but what this world needs right now more than anything else is this world needs Jesus. This world needs a lot of Jesus. But guess what? What this world is going to get is his light shining off of your life, reflecting from you. That's the light of Jesus that people really need to see. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus speaking to his followers, he says this, you are the light of the world. Remember we just read, he says, I am the light of the world. But now, a little further into his ministry, he knows he's leaving. He's, he wants us to reflect his light, okay? You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it up on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. By the way, uh, how many of you old school church people recognize the song coming out of this right here? Anybody see the song? You got one down here, anybody else? Okay, you got to sing it with me because you raised your hand. (laughs) This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Then a couple verses ago with that. One is, uh, uh, and this is my uh, youngest grandson, his favorite verse, because there's an action that goes along with it. Hide it under a bushel. No. no. <laughs> he loves that part. He just loves yelling no. So I'm going to let it shine. Then, then, then probably the most amazing part of a kid's song is they put this in there. Won't let Satan blow it out. Now, that's a kid's song dropping some crazy spiritual truths. I mean, some crazy good spiritual truths. We read in John chapter 1, the light came into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
The darkness can't extinguish it. Don't you love that? In a kid's song, love that song. Next verse. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the, your Father who is in heaven. So quick application, then we're done. How can we do that? How can we let his light shine through us? And for us as a church family, we always talk, talk about making Christ known. And uh, another way to say that according to what we're talking about today was be to let his light shine. How can we do that today? Well, we're blessed in this church, but we're blessed to be a blessing. So here's a couple of ways for you this week uh, to make Christ known and to let his light shine. <clears throat> Very practical. First one is this, give to the year-end missions offering. Yeah, I said it, give, okay? Whether you can give $5 or 500 or 5,000, whatever you can give, give, okay? 100% of what you give in this link goes outside of our church to help our missions partners who are making Christ known in ways that we cannot as a church family. So this is on our website. You go to our homepage, go to the bottom of the homepage, click that link right there. You can read about those missions organizations uh, and then give, or you can just go straight to give and, and give and let's let the light of Jesus shine. And, and, and you're like, really, $5? You want me to go there for five? Yes, yes. Do you wanna be a part of letting the light shine? Do you wanna be a part of making Christ known? Every little bit counts, man. So please give and give generously. And then another way to let your light shine this week is this. Invite somebody to Christmas Eve. Invite your one to Christmas Eve. Uh, most people that are in our church came to our church on one of three different occasions. Easter, movie series, Christmas Eve. Those are the big three times when people actually come to church for the first time. So we are at the beginning of a super important week of opportunity to be a light that points somebody else to Jesus. So don't miss it. We're going to have 30 services across our campuses. We're already, I mean, it's all planned out and hopefully the Lord's going to bless it and God's going to do wonderful things. And hopefully people will, will see the light of Jesus and uh, their lives will be changed forever and ever. Amen. So I'm gonna ask our campus pastors to come to the stage at this time because they're gonna close out the service, but I wanna read one more verse for you. Matthew chapter four, verse 16. This is actually Matthew quoting the prophet Isaiah uh, when the prophet Isaiah is talking about Jesus coming down to earth. He says this, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your light. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for him coming down to light our way. And let's, church family, let's shine that light of Jesus for the glory of God. Love you guys.